Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Ms. Becky Frankowicz, President of Manpower Group North America, to moderate a discussion on food and beverage and agriculture. Good morning. Perfect. Good morning. Thank you all for joining our session today. I'll be your moderator among um, these gentlemen joining me on the stage. Um, I'm Becky Frankowitz. I work for a company called Manpower Group. We are the leader in global workforce solutions and staffing, which means that we have to be students of industry, including food, beverage, and agriculture. So the extent of change that we're seeing today in the world is comparable to the shift from horse-powered to machine-powered. It's happening at a speed and scale that we've never, ever seen before. Several years ago at Manpower Group, we identified a set of macroeconomic forces that would dramatically impact the world. The panel today will explore two of those forces. The first is the rise of individual choice. Consumers are increasingly wanting personalization and information around the goods and services they consume, the way things were made, who made it, and of course the blockchain that tracks all of this. We are also seeing the rise of choice when it comes to the workforce. Consumers as employees, the consumerization of talent, means that employees are increasingly wanting to choose when, where, and how they work. And this behavior is enabled by the fact that we have limited supply and ever-increasing demand for talent. That's the first macroeconomic trend. The second is the technological revolution. Technology and automation is changing the way that companies operate, unlocking efficiency, as you'll hear the panelists talk about today, and enabling innovation. Food, beverage, and agriculture have always been on the forefront of technology, from the invention of the plow, to the horse collar, to today, precision agriculture and drones. So with that context, I'd like to ask my panelists to introduce themselves. And in doing so, answer the first question, gentlemen, which is in this context of technology, how are you seeing, what are you seeing change the most in the industry? So Tom, we'll start with you. Thank you, and uh, honored to be here. I'm the CEO of a company called Alfa Laval. We are about a five billion US uh, corporation uh, with a strong uh, history in uh, uh, food and beverages. Uh, in fact, uh, we ran our uh, globally the biggest production facility worldwide uh, in the late 1800s out of the Hudson River in New York, where we shipped 300,000 separators for milk and cream separation to the Midwest uh, per year in those days. And if you want to think about technology development, today we ship around 300 units per year, uh, producing immensely more uh, milk and cream than those 300,000. So if you want to think about what technology does over 100 years, uh, you can make multiplication yourself. And I can assure you it doesn't stop there. I, I think if I look at um, uh, the technology opportunities we have now, I think the uh, digital development is truly exciting for equipment makers like us that deliver equipment that are critical in the manufacturing processes in, in the food chain or in, a, uh, in the oil and gas sector, wherever you are. And, and we see an extremely rapid penetration of uh, monitoring programs, uh, safeguarding the productivity and, and the performance of uh, high value add equipment that goes into processes. And, and, and we see also as a result of that a much better opportunity for customers to benchmark within their plans or sometimes even with uh, other units as to how they are performing in energy consumption, consumables, process efficiency, uptime. Uh, and so I think the digital revolution is uh, you know, greatly affecting process industries of all kinds and certainly equipment makers like us. Perfect, thank you. Boon Chai? Yes, thank you, Becky. It's indeed my privilege and honor to be speaking here and I wish to also thank you, Selected USA ED office, to organize this impeccable event and I impress every time I join Selected USA. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm Boon Chai from Jaren Pokapan Group. Jaren Pokapan Group, or CP Group, is a Thai conglomerate with 63 billion US dollar revenue. 
our core business range from agri-food value chain, retail distribution, and telecommunication. We are globally present in more than 100 countries. We have more than 200 subsidiaries, and we invest more than 20 countries, including Asia, Europe, and United States. We are also the group listed in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, DJSI, and thus we adhere very much about the sustainability context. We are also a member of World Economic Forum. As the root of the organization, the company, back to the 98 years ago, from the agricultural to further into agri-food value chain, retail distribution, and telecommunication. Yet, we don't forget about the root of the agricultural. So, we wish also to be our vision, kitchen of the world. What does it mean? We like to extend our key capability beyond our home market in Asia to elsewhere in the world. And that's the reason we invest 1.1 billion US dollars in 2016 for a food business in the United States. And this is one of the third, I would say, largest uh, frozen packed food on tray. We employ more than 2,000 employees here with four different production footprints, two in Ohio and two also in California. As such, I thought this is one of the best investments in the best ecosystem, best competitive market, and best ecosystem in terms of the business environment. This connecting the dot where we have a home base in Asia, we're connecting the dot in Europe, and now we have a footprint in the United States. So we can leverage these kinds of the cutting edge technology to bring the benefit to the consumer of the United States and elsewhere. And if you're talking about technology, you look at our broad range of the value chain, I'm pretty sure each and every one. You look at egg farming, from a very conventional farming, now you're talking about smart farming, precision farming, you use this technology of a satellite to GPS, AI, IoT, you make it very smart farming. You're talking about food, we are in a meat producer company. We sometimes recruit the employee that what is specific for them to contribute to the organization. The one reason they say, I'm vegan. That's right. So there's some chip and chain of the technology we should be aware of. So alternative protein and plant space is already a three billion US dollar purely only in US. So we have to prepare these kinds of technology. We're talking about retail and distribution, the technology of O2O. Not many anymore now come into the retail store. They shop it online. And some of the online players go to the offline. So a little bit conversion between O2O. And last but not least, telecommunication. I'm not that sure how the home phones available and exist. I have one as part of my furniture rather than communication. <laughs> and you're talking about my phone from the 1G into now 5G. So it's all about technology. Yes. What I like to say is that in the end, this is something to disrupt. Either we are early innovator, we stay on the surf, then we could be an opportunity. If we are lag guard, we ignore the technology, and then we'll be a threat. Yeah. CP Group, very clear from the group CEO, Mr. Superchai. We are a technology-driven company. We spend a lot of time in uh, research and development. We have more than 5,000 researchers. So we believe this is one of our core competence. Perfect, thank you, Boon Chai. I should have said in my introduction, um, I'm uniquely qualified to moderate because I grew up on a family farm in Texas. Um, we didn't have a lot of smart farming, so I'm excited to learn more about that. So with that, Renato. Thank you, Becky. I'm uh, Renato Hirsch, Chief Strategy Officer for uh, Salimph Tech. At Salimph Tech, we have a digital platform that optimizes farming processes. We already operate in 10 different countries and various crops, ranging from uh, sugarcane to soya beans, corn and cotton, uh, going through perennials. And I would like to highlight to you guys what a great time it is to be alive.
the world is changing in a very fast pace. If one looked at the 10 biggest companies in terms of market cap 10 years ago, only one would be a technology company. That was Microsoft. Today, seven out of the 10 biggest companies in the world in terms of, of uh, market cap are technology companies. Alexa was launched in November 2014. Today, four and a half years down the road, there are more than 52 million speaker devices in the United States. That's a penetration of more than 15%. And what's going on in agriculture? There is a digital revolution happening as we speak. A digital revolution where IoT, Internet of Things, meets artificial intelligence. Moore's law has gifted us with uh, sensors that allow us to have information on everything in real time and with artificial intelligence, both cloud and edge processing, which allow us not only to capture this information, but to process it in real time and deliver feedback into processes. And what we do with that, we help farmers to do more with less and to, to produce in a more sustainable way. We help farmers to trigger their planting based on uh, soil moisture and soil temperature. We help farmers to trigger their spraying based on the weather conditions, wind speed, wet temperature, uh, plant moisture. By doing that, we help them to reduce the amount of chemicals used in the products. We help them improve the machine logistics throughout the processes, also in uh, harvesting. And we, we help them to reduce the number of machines in the field, the, the number of uh, people in the field, and the fuel consumed in the, the field. So that's what we're uh, talking about. And these things happen in a very fast pace. We as a company, in the last four years, We've gone from 20% to 60% penetration in sugarcane in Brazil for digital solutions. This is the second year that we, we've been operating in row crops and soybeans, corn, and cotton. And we are reaching 7% penetration in Brazil, which is the, the, the second biggest uh, grower in the, the planet. We've launched, we are very proud to have launched our uh, US headquarters out of uh, the Purdue Research Park in Indiana. And things there are maturing faster than we expected. We are probably going to deliver in 2020 what we expected we were going to achieve only in 2021. So that's uh, who we are and we, where we are. We are just in the beginning. Hopefully, we'll uh, get far. Thank you. Thank you, Renato. And definitely, last but not least, Matthew, if you'd introduce yourself. Sure. First, Becky, thank you very much, and to Select USA for pulling us together to be able to spend some time together and have a dialogue. My name is Matthew Ferner, and I work for a company called Fermanish. Today, about at least half of this room would have used products that actually come from this company that I work for, and you would probably know very little to, to what we actually do. So we're a privately owned company. We're the largest in the world in our space. So we work in flavors, taste, nutrition, and perfume, or fragrances. And we're a $4 billion company, and we have about 8,000 employees Worldwide, so, so maybe just to give a bit of perspective of kind of what we do to make this come to life. Imagine it's a Saturday and you are in the shower washing your hair and you're, I'm kind of bored of my shampoo. What can I do differently today? I want to go out and buy a new shampoo. So you go to the store, you end up deciding to look at the myriad of selection that exists today when buying a shampoo. So what, what do we do? What do I do, right? I look at the products, I try to understand what's on the shelf, and then I start to make a narrow selection. Maybe Mango Madness looks really interesting to me. Maybe it's going to be Bahama Breeze, right? But I kind of get it down to two or three. But what do most consumers do at that stage? You look around, is anybody watching? You grab a bottle, you take it, and what do you do next? You open it, right? And you smell it. So the company's job, what we do, is we make that experience for you come to life. So we are to deliver a fragrance to help you, help us, make a decision about whether we buy that product. So why do we choose the product we choose typically in that scenario? It's typically around the fragrance that you just enjoyed. So we help consumers make decisions when buying a product. 
that kind of puts it into perspective in terms of how we work, and we do the same thing when it comes to flavors um, and what we taste. In terms of technology, absolutely, like you know, my co-panelists have said, it's changing extremely fast. Just to pick on one area, when you think about you know, 15 years ago, who was talking about smart proteins and plant-based proteins to replace meat? And that's exactly where we work actively today, and it requires a lot of big brains to come around that topic to understand the vegan issues and the trends that we see, which are, are, are not going away, they're only increasing, but it's a much different process to go out and to work you know, with cattle to bring meat versus now working with enzymes and transforming the process of enzymes to something that can replicate nature. And so these are really challenging times, they're really exciting times, and it's exciting to see the enthusiasm from, from the panelists as well on these topics. Great, thank you. I had no idea that Matthew was gonna go into your showers this morning, so just so you know, that's a surprise to all of us. Um, but I knew what you were gonna say, because I just bought some shampoo this weekend and I opened it and smelled it, so uh, I hate it when they seal it, because then it it's produces the opportunity. Right. So um, to dig a little deeper, so we talked a bit about technology, now I'd like to shift to this um, rise of individual choice, particularly around talent. And Tom, I'd like to start with you and understand what has your company done to attract and develop talent in this world of tight demand? Well, I, I actually think uh, one, one of the most important uh, talent issues and people issues when it comes to you know, the new generation and how, how things are is the problem of the, you know, the dying traveling salesman and mm -hmm. service technician for that matter. I mean, we have hundreds of people traveling in the US. Most of us in my age, we grew up uh, leaving uh, home on a Sunday evening and coming home on a Friday. Mm -hmm. and, and we have uh, significant challenges in filling those positions today working in, in, in that way. And I think this is one of the most exciting areas for uh, the digital development, that it will enable people to perhaps combine you know, a family life and a traveling life uh, in, a, in, a, in a different balance than in the past. So part of what we are trying to do in, in talent is to, to deal with this type of balance between uh, uh, people. The, the other thing that is changing for us in the US, I think uh, being a European-based company originally, is that we've, we've done management development very much from a uh, home base, so we've been sending people out. And I think this is changing also. Uh, in the world we have today, it, it's, it's the, you know, the, the, the corporate center is less important, and it's happening out in, in, the, uh, in the real world, if you like. And, and consequently, we need to develop in a different way also senior uh, managers from a US perspective. So now we're actually sending people to Europe from the US for the first time. Uh, in order to get them engaged, get them to see something differently, and then coming back with a different experience. Uh, so I think there are a lot of tools and opportunities, but I think the, the general background to the question is we need to be much more active on this area than we ever been before. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I was with a panel of, of CEOs or group CEOs a couple weeks ago, Tom, and the question asked was about this decentralization of a headquarter, if you will. And the question I was asked is how do you build culture? when people aren't constantly together. Mm, exactly. And so I think that's a real uh, defining question for all of us, because we are seeing the fastest growing benefit around non-wage benefit for white collar jobs is telecommuting. So we'll increasingly see consumers want to work where they choose to work. So I think that's insightful. I, I, I totally agree. And I think uh, the cultural aspect of a company is so important today. And, and it goes with the purpose of what we are doing. And, and uh, I, I think the technology transition we are in, not only in the digital area, but also when it comes to the renewable side and climate aspects and other things like that, you know, the purpose of being involved in supporting and driving that change is a fantastic glue uh, for getting teams together. And, and we see enormous excitement on our youngsters in the, in the group when it comes to these areas. Yes, youngsters. <laughs> youngsters. <laughs> I like it. The 30 year olds. Yes, yes. Yeah. Renato, I'd love for you to build on that in terms of what your company is doing to attract and retain talent. Yeah, you've mentioned a very important point, uh, Becky, which is uh, culture. Uh, that's a difficult challenge. In the last uh, two years, we've gone from uh, 90 professionals to 400 uh, professionals, and it's a very sticky employee base. Uh, what we tend to do, we tend to hire by the attitude and not by the, the, mm. the knowledge. Like, we hire very young people and uh, we train them internally. It's been successful, like what we need, like we need to have kids that love what they do, that love agriculture, that love making a change in the, the world. Uh, in the US, uh, we're being successful so far. It's uh, still the early days. 
Uh, we've started uh, back in uh, November last year officially. It was the official launch after one year researching. Uh, today we have uh, 15 people out of uh, our U.S. headquarters in uh, Indiana. By the end of the year, we want to have some 40, 50 people uh, out here. And one thing that it was a very positive surprise uh, was Purdue. We've set up our uh, U.S. headquarters inside the Purdue uh, Research Park, which gives us access to great talent, both in agricultural sciences and in engineering. So that's uh, what we're doing as of now. It's great. I love, uh, just to capture something Renato said, we hire by attitude versus knowledge. We're increasingly seeing, as skills are changing at the pace of technology, that what you've done in the past is much less important than what you can do in the future. So increasingly, we're, we will need to hire people based on what they can do versus what they have done. So I, I love that. And get that, like uh, uh, data sciences, artificial intelligence, like get somebody with 10 years experience. like. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'd say. Good luck with That's that. That's true. And it's changed yeah. so quickly. So. That's true. Um, Boonchai, this next question is for you, and you referenced it a bit in your opening. Um, I'd love for you to share with this group why you see the U.S. as a really focused area for investment for your company. If, if, if I look to the investment we make in the United States, to me, I'm very convinced that U.S. state, United States, has a great ecosystem. This is dynamism. If I look, I split into two plum. One is the three superpower that mean engine for the economy, the world largest economy in US, and this is big and robust, very most resilient economy. The second one is the demand side, and that's push from the GDP to the world largest demand of the consumer. 325 powerful spending power. And I've, if I ship this back to a supply side, this is, I would say, a whole value chain in food and agricultural space. Raw material is one of the most critical separative. So in the end, if I look at a corn and grain, corn and soybean in Midwest, this is one of the most competitive raw material we had in US. And that's a reason we invest 1.1 billion US dollar here. And yet you have another two core pillars. One of the most critical is also technology. We all know that US is one of the most advanced technology. In our industry, what we need most is biotechnology. Uh, genomic is a gene sequencing, gene selection. I would say, talking about the digital uh, uh, transformation, AI, IoT, blockchain. Another core pillar is educational system. And no surprise, when I see from the screen from the day one, top 20 university in the world coming 15 from, uh, from United States. And this make a lot of sense to bring these kinds of skillful workforces, which has helped the organization very well. And that's something we see this is a best and great ecosystem of the investment in the United States. But yet, if I would love that since we invest here, what kinds of complementary we could bring also into US great ecosystem. If I look at the demand side, yes, it's kind of the world biggest consumption. But some of those products, like seafood, especially trim, American, you consume 4.4 pounds per person per year. Of shrimp? Shrimp. Wow. Only shrimp. And if I multiply 325 million population, you are talking about 700,000 tons of trim you consume per year. And they tell you one thing, you get shocked. 95% of those consumption are imported, <coughs> are imported. So you're talking about trade deficit in US only for the trim product. We, CP Group, we are one of the world leading aquaculture company, especially we are world leader for the trim, intricated business. What we need to do, we can create a very sustainable trim culture for United States. So instead of you import, you can have a self-sufficient, a long-term sustainable business model. You can also export it. And this is something I need to wholeheartedly thank you, 
Secretary Wilberlos. He visits at our headquarters and inspires us about these kinds of projects. And I had to tell him that we have a firm commitment to this project. Why is that? In the end, it returned trim culture in the US to be a very sustainable with three bullet points. Any time in a year, because we use the indoor system, temperature control, anywhere in the United States, uh, in the west, in the east, in the north, in the south, and most importantly, as we adhere to sustainability context, it's a total waste recycling. So this is a whole ecosystem where I just thought this is our firm commitment to be responsible and benefit to the consumer of the United States. Perfect, thank you. Um, Matthew, I'd love to hear what your firm's also doing at Firmanish on um, why the U.S. is a productive market of focus for you. Sure, I, I'm really glad, Boon Chai, that you spent so much time actually explaining that it is easy to do business here. And it, it is a reality, but I think when over 20 years of my career was outside the United States, I only came back about two years ago. And I've worked in some really tough markets uh, in Asia in particular, and with three different assignments. And I'll tell you what, you kind of get used to working in, in some challenging markets, and people become kind of accustomed to a certain way of working. And one of my hesitancies, actually, when I, when I said, look, next opportunity in the United States was, I'm not so sure it's going to be very dynamic compared to living in China, which is where I was at the time. You know, how wrong I was. I then came to the United States and realized it's so easy to, to make money. It's so easy to contribute back to society, which is an important part of one of our values, that you, I recognize that within the last couple of years, we made significant progress because it is just easy to do business. When you do business uh, a case review or looking for a capital investment, you, know, you don't necessarily quantify what that means in the business case. It might be a soft factor or a regulatory environment, uh, intellectual property. These are, these are important factors, though, actually. And if, if anybody knows how they're quantifying this and it's working well and you can convince a board, I'd love to talk to you about it. But it, it, it's a challenge, right? But actually, there's an enormous amount of, of cost that you spend managing those issues. Mm -hmm. So to maybe to just move uh, to another kind of obvious reason of why we're here, you know, there are a lot of people interested in food and bev today here. And this, at the end of the day, is where a lot of the global headquarters are and where the big decision makers are for some of the biggest companies in the world. It's important for us to be close to them, so our global headquarters for where we service that business is run out of the United States. So on one side, you have that also ecosystem supporting food and beverage. And at the same time, what a great country when it comes to innovation and entrepreneurs. So we also need to be very closely working with people who are actually working from their garage literally, to create products. These are how the byproducts of the world are created. And the impossible meat, and where that comes from, it comes from little ideas that grow really big um, with support. And so we want to make sure we're there understanding those trends, because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. we want to work very carefully with them to understand where those trends are going, because we have a big role to play in how that's going to evolve. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you talked about um, entrepreneurialism, because that ties perfectly into this rise of individual choice because people are choosing to be contractors, freelancers, et cetera, at a faster rate, and a lot of that is manifesting itself in developing your own product or solution. So Correct. Um, and more people in garages. Right. Yeah, and there are barriers to entry for these entrepreneurs, right? They don't need assets, That's really. Right. They just need their ideas. That's right. Again, because it's back to what exists in this country, right? You don't need kitchens. You don't need yeah. pilot plants. That's all provided for you. So as long, as long as you have partners around you, you can bring these ideas to market very fast. We have clients on the West Coast, something is on the shelf within two to three weeks yeah. of the idea when they come and meet with us. That's really fast innovation. Yeah, I love that. The democratization of, of innovation is what's happening. I love um, companies that are partnering with individuals around that, so thank you for that. Um, Tom, I'd like to come back to you and change gears just a little bit. Um, given our audience, I'd love you to share how you've leveraged some economic, um, state economic development organizations in your investment decisions, and if you have plans to increase that collaboration. We'll, we'll, I'm, I must say, uh, uh, I think there are two countries in the world that stands out when it comes to uh, support for industrial investments and activities, and, and in our experience, that, that is China and the US. In, in both countries, you meet with uh, state, provincial uh, representative who are committed to, together with you to actually develop something. And, and uh, sadly to say, in Europe, you often meet uh, uh, organizations that see industrial permits as a problem 
and, and not as an asset. So I think just the fact that you uh, walk into on the state level to somebody who uh, welcomes the business, you know, and I think uh, clearly to say under, under strict uh, uh, sustainability regulations and water conservation issues and whatnot, I, I don't think this is about being uh, re relaxed about uh, how we treat our environment here in the US or in China for that matter. But uh, I, I think that has been the most encouraging thing. We, we've done a lot of, since we've been here for 130 years, it's not that we're starting from scratch uh, by any means, but you need to change your footprint, consolidate, uh, expand, uh, sometimes due to acquisitions, move around and, and, and uh, these type of things. And, and we found that uh, in, in places like Oklahoma, where we've done significant investment over the last couple of years, uh, in Richmond, uh, Virginia, just around the corner from here, and in Houston, uh, we meet uh, you know, tremendous partnerships and many of them are long term. We, we've been here for 30 years in Virginia. We've been uh, in Houston for even longer. And uh, so, you, you know, you become, and as you say, you also become part of the community there. I mean, the, the bonding in those communities is, is very strong. Uh, they are proud of us and we are proud of them. So oh, we, we, nice. we think it's fantastic. Very nice. Wunchai, same question for you. I think we have a very close interaction in, in collaboration with the EOD from the federal and also from the state. I think we have a three different states, before investment, after investment, and future investment. And then the pre-investment I was here last three years, and I bumped to each and everyone from a federal EDO and also the uh, subnational EDO. We got very great information and knowledge about tax planning, tax incentive, uh, support of the investor. So in the end, we can uh, qualify a little bit, calibrate where to invest. After we have the acquisition or we have the investment, what we need to do is we bump into the subnational, for example, EDO in, in uh, Ohio. They look at the investment plan right after the acquisition, right after the investment. We have around about 150 million US dollars just to upgrade the equipment just to reskill employee, just to retrain employee, and just to upskill the employee. And that's some kinds of workforce development. We work closely hand in hand with the EDO office in Ohio, and likewise in California. And in the future, we also need to work with them. I cite some examples about the aquaculture industry. We love to be somewhere, anytime, anywhere. We need some state to start first. I have to thank you, Congressman, uh, Ted Joho on the third district of Florida. Once we spelled out, he ran out all the results from the state, from the EDO, and they come back together, and then go into the state, make a size selection. You compare here and there, black and white. Negotiate. So this is something, if we work closely with EDO, this is something we can gain benefit, as a mutual benefit from the investor and also from the United States. And this is my experience. Yes, I love, um, Bunchai, you mentioning the EDO's partnership around upskilling and reskilling. Um, it is critical in our country today that we're constantly looking at not just people's skills today, but what's going to be in demand tomorrow. And all of us, public, private, enterprise, educational institution alike, will need to partner. Um, so that brings us back to Purdue, which uh, brings us back to you, Renato. So I'd love to hear your take on this question as well. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's a good opportunity for me to share a bit of the story on how we, we got to the, the US. Uh, we first uh, presented the US opportunity to our uh, uh, board, it was July 2017, in a board meeting in an offsite. Well, the idea was uh, scrutinized, uh, or like, well, Brazil is a huge market, we still have a lot to go, why go to the US? <laughs> I'm a bit of a nudnik, I came out here anyway in uh, December. Uh, and I got back with a plan uh, under my arm saying, we need to do this. There is no one doing what we are doing in the US. We got to go there. I got the approval of a small budget and we started ramping up in the US. That was December 2017, March 2018. We are out in uh, California and San Francisco and uh, we go out pitching our idea to Kip Tom. Don't know if, uh, if you guys have heard of Kip Tom. Kip Tom is a big farmer in uh, Indiana a uh, very relevant farmer, and he's now the U.S. ambassador at FAWAT, the UN for Food and Agriculture Organization. And we go there pitching uh, Cape Tom, 
and he brings in a, a lady with him, Beth Bechdel from Agrinovus. And he's like, uh, he starts pushing us. He's like, you're serious about the US? So are you gonna set up a, a, an operation here? Where are you gonna set up? And like, didn't know much of the US geography and how to do business here. And he said, like, yeah, here, there, there. And Beth jumps on the table and she uh, says, no, you got to come to Indiana. You got to meet us. And we're like, okay, like, we'll go to Indiana. And uh, Beth from uh, Agrinovus introduced us to the leadership at Purdue. Uh, we are there with uh, uh, Mitch Daniels, with uh, uh, Brian Edelman, and we, are get, uh, we get very impressed. And we're like, whoa, like, uh, we look around uh, Purdue, all we see is corn and soybeans, and we're like, whoa, this is a good place for us. We look inside, like there is uh, great talent in uh, agricultural sciences and engineering. We were like, well, this is starting to, to, to make sense. And then we got uh, introduced to Elaine Biddle at the IEDC, the India, in, Indiana Development uh, Corporation, Economic Development uh, Corporation. Uh, and we get the grant from the, the, the government to set up our uh, operations out there. Then we launch our uh, operations in November uh, last year, officially, our headquarters at the Agrinovas event in uh, Indiana. And we got uh, Governor Holcomb uh, giving a, a speech in the video for us. So this is beautiful. Like, it's absolutely beautiful to see the intersection that we have in the US between business, government, and academia. Like, it's, uh, it's amazing coming from Brazil, seeing these interactions, these lively interactions, and every, the willingness to make things happen is just uh, beautiful. Thank you for uh, all the support. That's awesome. So I have a question now for all the panelists. And Matthew, I'm going to start with you. Sure. As we look at, you know, we've talked about the pace of change of technology. We've talked about the pace of change of skills. As you look out, and let's just take a short-term horizon, three to five years, what are you most excited about that you see is going to change the industry you sit in? I'll go a bit with the, the wellness trend, because there, there's so many we could pick from, I'm sure, right? So in terms of wellness, right, it's important uh, to, to understand that the, the diets of the world actually are moving to where we want what? Less sugar, less salt, less fat, right? And it's a great opportunity for us to get involved in it. It requires new technology, new solutions. But I think what's amazing about this space is that we can't act by ourselves in order to ultimately drive the right choices for consumers. So we, we, today we are able to bring uh, 30 to 5% less sugar and take it out of a product because of technology that we've been able to, to, to develop over the last few years. That's a great thing to be able to talk about. Um, but when you take 30 to 50% of sugar out of a formula, and let's imagine you're talking about dry breakfast cereal, uh, which can tend to have a lot of sugar involved, you're taking a lot of mass out of the product. Mm -hmm. So we can say, look, we can reduce sugar, but then we have to talk to others saying, but look, we need to put something else out there, right? Because maybe you're used to a, a breakfast cereal of this size, you're not gonna be interested in, in it, seeing it change too much. So then we have to involve others and partners to say, look, we can do this. What else can you bring to a healthy choice as well for, for the consumers? And so, of course, clients and everybody gets very excited about it, but it's tough, and that's why it's fun, um, is because there is the opportunity. So I think when you see this whole space, you'll be seeing a lot more products that are reducing sugar, salt, fat. We've talked a little bit about alternative proteins. And all this requires different ways of working, not just ourselves, but many players involved as well. Yeah, I love that story, Matthew. One thing we didn't talk about backstage is uh, I used to manage the Quaker Foods business for PepsiCo, and we faced that exact challenge. It was more of a consumer challenge. As you reduce bulk, you reduce size, and who wants to see a cereal box? You know, in the United States, our cereal boxes are like this big. Who wants to see a cereal box this big? Then you have a price value challenge. So uh, I'm very close to, the, to what you're facing, so very interesting. Um, but still, the noble goal of making our food healthier and higher quality um, is worth figuring that out. Absolutely. So Renato, same question for you. As you look on three to five years, so not what we've talked about today, but a little further out, what are you most excited about impacting your industry? Uh, I think that there are two core uh, trends. Uh, one is uh, autonomy. Uh, if you think through, it's probably much easier to have uh, full autonomy in a farm environment than it is to have uh, full autonomy in a city environment. So that's one uh, core theme, like uh, the way we see it, we bring autonomy from a process perspective. And uh, w we trigger processes based on the real online conditions of all the different uh, parameters. And we're bringing more and more autonomy into the machines to, in a couple of years, have a full autonomous form. So that's one uh, trend. 
And one trend that uh, relates a lot to what uh, Bunchain was saying and what Matt was saying is, is, this, uh, is this trend of uh, uh, transparency, like transparency, mm -hmm. sustainability, like uh, we as consumers, we demand to know what we are eating. We demand to know what our kids are eating. So with technology, now we are able to trace with blockchain, one of the, the outputs of our platform is traceability. Our core value add is operational efficiency, but we are tracking everything that is happening mm -hmm. during the production process. And we, we, we are now starting to print this in a blockchain. So that when we get to the farm gate, you get the full history of that uh, produce. And then you, you'll bring this into the Alpha Laval uh, machines and you'll take it out to the protein uh, from CP. When it gets to your uh, home, like you'll just uh, scan that product and you know the, the, the full uh, history of that produce. Absolutely. So that's a, a, a trend. And uh, that's going to happen in the, the near future. Great, thank you. Boonchai, same question for you. A little further out horizon, what is most exciting to you? He's my partner. So let's <laughs> just echo what he said. So what he That's says, the there you go. <laughs> There's a I deal think, happening uh, on the stage here. Uh, uh, sustainability is the center of everything in what the business yeah. we has been doing. It might be three years, it might be five years, but we have to start from now. In our food business, we talk about food security. We're talking about food safety. We're talking about uh, traceability. We're talking about sustainability. But it's far away from where we realize. Let me put something a very provocative innovation, but tangible for sustainability. We have, we have our research and development innovation talking about microwave technology, the industrial scale. From the past, if we like to have a shelf stable product, we need to use a chamber of the steam to kill these kinds of microorganisms so that it can be put into a shelf stable a room temperature. But they also destroy the identity of the color, meat, texture, and whatever. What we have is a micro technology dermal assistant. What we need to do is use this kinds of microwave technology to sterilize the ready meal, ready meal, mm -hmm. that ready. means mm -hmm. everything is inside, carbo, protein, vegetable, it keeps the same identity. And yet, this kind of sterilized microwave technology can keep into the room temperature for one year. Wow. If you calculate from the production to the cold chain of our warehouse, logistic, retailer, household, how much of energy you could save as a sustainability. We save the earth. Wow. But this is not something we could do within a day or a year. We had our product in Europe, but there might be something we have to make a move to be a mass market to benefit the consumer everywhere in the world. We save the earth, wow. We save the earth. Wow. And Tom, for our final thought on that question. Well, I, I think I'll go a little bit outside of the uh, food and beverage sector, which we've it. been very focused on here. I think in, in, uh, uh, in my view, the most en uh, energetic issue and promising issue is where renewable energy is going, and particularly related to energy storage. Uh, as you know, uh, the issue we have in uh, the climate uh, problems we're tackling with renewables is that uh, it's volatile. And a volatile energy uh, supply is not a very good thing for consumers. You want to control when you're using electricity or not. Uh, our view is that battery technology is, can be great for cars and mobile units, but for large storage, uh, it's, it's not efficient and it's not environmental friendly either. So you need to go to thermal storage. And, and saving energy in, in molten salt or any other abrasive type of, of solution is extremely uh, corrosive and problematic from many points of view. So our technology in heat transfer development uh, is extremely important to find energy storage solutions that work on a large scale. And interestingly enough, uh, that technology development is happening right now. I think it has a chance to be commercial within five years. We think there are pilot plants within two to three. And uh, as opposed to the way we worked with technology in the past, which would be you know, ourselves starting to look at it, drawing up the systems, 
we've gone in partnership with a small startup company in uh, Boston. And uh, there we have the right uh, venture capitalists, we have the right startup mentalities, we have a couple of industrial partners, and we are totally focused to get the heart and lung of this system, which is the con technology we control, to function in this type of environment. And uh, I think if, if we can wow. break through on, on that uh, project, then the whole energy storage uh, solution for the world's renewable energy sources will be solved once and for all. Wow. I love that. Very see you in five years. Yeah, see, see you in five years. I love, we're saving the earth, literally. That's, we are. That's incredible. Looking forward. Um, for, our, for our final rapid fire question, what I'd like to ask the panelists to do is leave us with a tweetable message so that everyone here can take something out of the room. So if you had one final thought for the audience, what would that be? And Matthew, we'll start again with you. Sure. Look, for, just make it happen, right? I think you are leaving money on the table that could definitely be yours if you are playing in this market. It's really easy to do business, and I think by just kind of taking that leap, that opportunity, more likely than not, you'll be very successful here and you will grow your business substantially. And I know there's some people thinking about this, but I think from my experience, just do it, and I'm sure you'll have a great experience. Perfect, Renato? Action is the main thing. Real-time actionable insights, doing more with less. Mm. Mm. Do more with less. Mm. Unchai? Maybe if I uh, smell a little bit more to a second, just to thank you, Becky, and also my fellow panelists. I also like to thank you, the U.S. Embassy of Thailand, who bring all the support to me and CP. But one of the most important message I like to echo again, our group CEO, Super Chai. So he said, for all the investor, and this is something just to represent, and since one of those is also CP, we had to ensure the business and investment we made has a three benefit principle. That means what we invest must first benefit the country we invest. Secondly, the community we engage. And thirdly, is in the end back to the company and shareholder. And this make more sustainable investment and business. And that's something we are commit on this. What about the technology? What about sustainability? We adhere to this kinds of the context anyway. Thank you. Tom? Well, I, I think you heard from uh, the panel, uh, unrehearsed, I might uh, add, <laughs> that the technology optimism is relatively big in this group. And uh, I think that doesn't uh, match so well with part of the public discussion going on today, which is that uh, uh, robotics, uh, autonomous units, and other things will lead to mass un unemployment and things like that. I actually don't believe that for a second. Uh, my belief is that technology is here to develop people to smarter people and products and services to better products and services. And I think that is the promise of uh, what we're talking about today. Yes, and, and the history of every time we face technology, by the way, that we've created new jobs, not, um, not net new jobs versus destroying jobs. So uh, I want to recap a couple of things that we've heard from the panel as we close. So first, we heard Boon Chai talk about the ecosystem that the United States of America has to offer, whether it's from local partnerships with states, the demand that the U.S. economy represents, or the education support that we actually heard Renato and Boon Chai talk about. We have an ecosystem that's ready for development. Um, Matthew added a couple of times, if you heard him, that it's easy to do business here, and he's done business in several other parts of the world, and it's easy to do business in the United States of America. Um, Tom talked about the U.S. stands out, along with China, for support of organizational growth, and this trend we're seeing on the decentralization of headquarters that creates an opportunity, actually, for work-life balance. And so I appreciated so much hearing several of our panelists not just talk about the business side of what they do, but the people side, the human side of what they do, whether it's work-life balance or community involvement that you heard Boon Chai talk about of one of the three pillars of his company. So I appreciated that. And then, of course, we had Renato um, open us with, it's a great time to be alive. Um, Boon Chai says we're saving the earth. Um, and also, Renato talked about IoT meeting AI. And then I loved Tom's closing comments when he said, and I, by the way, we know this to be true, the storyline has to change from will robots take my job to what's the role in humans augmenting technology and leveraging human capability for higher order work and processing. Technology is changing the way we work around the world and right here in Washington, D.C. and across the United States of America. The defining challenge of our time 
will be harnessing technology for improvements in quality, sustainability, efficiency, which you heard many of the panelists talk about today, but also harnessing technology for the reskilling of our population because the population growth is slowing globally with a couple of exceptions. And the defining challenge will be ensuring that we have people ready and able to do the work that we have, not just today, but tomorrow. So the final thought I leave you with is something that Renato introduced, which is the future is much more about what you can do versus what you have done in your past. So with that, I thank you all. Gentlemen, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having us. Have a great rest of your conference. Thank you.